I'm so, I know, I love you, my sister. I'm so happy. I'm so happy to spend time with you again. Thanks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> It's easy getting dressed in the morning in order to think about what to put on. <laughs> General West, I may call you Nadia? Please. Thank you. Um, the last time we were together, we were in Aspen at Brainstorm Tech, where you dazzled the crowd with um, your vision for the transformation of the way the military dispenses medical care. And it was really from, from the human aspect to systems and technologies now in the future. But you, you dropped a line that inspired this panel, which was, if we can train empathy, we can make almost anything happen. Yes. So I wanted to build on that this time. Let, can we start a little bit with just what it is that you do, so, and, and where it is you've been able to um, influence systems and, and outcomes based on empathy? OK, thank you. Um, so um, as, as was mentioned, I'm the commanding general of US Army Medical Command, so that means that I'm in charge of all of the medical assets within our Army. That includes about 130,000 um, personnel, both military and our wonderful Department of the Army civilians and volunteers, um, and all components. So that's active, guard, and reserve um, you know, medical assets. I'm also responsible for um, military treatment facilities, and we're undergoing a transformation of that right now um, all throughout the uh, the globe. We have some in Germany, Korea, um, uh, and all throughout the continental United States. And I'm also in charge of a research and, and a materiel command and a training um, platform for training medical. Um, so uh, and my job is to make sure, and my role is to make sure that every soldier, and I will say sailor, airman, marine, and coast guardsman, because we take care of everyone who needs our care, to do the best we can to make sure that they get back safe and sound to their families if uh, they're ever injured and to provide them outstanding care to keep them ready and their families and uh, our uh, beneficiary population ready as well. So maybe we can um, dig into how the military has evolved during your tenure with the tale of two West Points. The West Point you joined and the West Point your son is currently, is currently at now. Right, and it's, it's hard to believe. I mean, I was uh, recently at a a 35-year reunion, and that's like, wow, I mean, how many, you know, years? So, so it's been a while. So I, I, I started in 1978, um, the summer is when I entered uh, as, a, as a young 17-year-old. And in my class of about 1,300, there were 126 women that started. Wow. And 62 of us graduated at the end of, of about almost 900 uh, that were left in the Corps of Cadets. And it was very different then. You had uh, four answers, right, you learned. You know, yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir, and sir, I do not understand. And, um, and so fast forward, and really, I mean, that was it, because it they were training, you know, and you're brand new, um, trying to teach you what it is to be a soldier, to be a military personnel, to, to kind of learn and, and be inculcated into the, to the values that we, we held there. So you had to listen a lot and not say a lot. Um, and so uh, it was really hard for me because I love to talk. And so um, fast forward to my son started in 2015 and I was giving him all these uh, pointers so he would be successful and I told him about the four answers. And uh, you know, after he f completed the summer training, he was talking about having a conversation with his squad leader. And I said, what do you mean conversation? He goes, you know, mom, when, <laughs> when you know, someone says something to you and then you talk back to them and then they talk back to you, conversation. <laughs> And I, I said, yeah, I know what that is, but <laughs> wow, what about your four answers? And he said, you know, that we, they don't do that anymore. He goes, yeah, we, used, we heard about that in the olden days. And I'm like, hey, wait a second, you know. <laughs> but he, and it made a good point because he said, you know, it was in the environment where you spend so much time to recruit talent um, and then to be to the point where, you know, it's, it's a little bit, you know, very, very prescriptive and right. not a lot of interaction. Sometimes people will question this, in fact, in this environment, why am I here? I could have gone to any other school where I could have a conversation, but I'm being, you know, talked to. Um, and so it was more kinder and gentler to, because it's, you want that, um, you know, leadership styles trained early, because if you're trained, you know, you only have four answers, and when you graduate, then the people who work for you, you know, maybe right. are subject to that type. So I think that's the change um, and the transformation um, that's necessary if you want to make sure you can recruit and retain good talent and have good leaders uh, for our young men and women who, um, who are joining an all-volunteer force who also have options. Right. So how has this translated into your work, into a more collaborative approach, and, and getting better health outcomes? Because in many ways, what you're, actually, what you're doing is, um, translates to the outside world, to, to healthcare delivery in, in any context. But in the military, 
I, I imagine that it's, it's required um, a certain finesse. It does, but if you um, allow all members of your team to have an input, then they own the, um, the decision and the way forward, and they will really work hard to see it come to uh, fruition. And they also feel valued because you've just allowed someone to provide input into a solution of what you want to do. And I'll, I'll give you a real recent example. Um, we have these uh, operational hospitals called combat support hospitals, and that's what we deploy in a, in a, you know, in a combat environment or sometimes with uh, disaster relief. And so these are these modular hospitals that you put out in a field, and there's a template of how you set them up. Um, you know, this goes here, and, you know, and it makes sense because you have to have everything, everything work up. But there were two young soldiers who um, were operating room techs and saw that it was really inefficient to take you know, um, you know, dirty instruments, you have to take it through one room and come in this area, you clean them, package them up, then you take them back. He says, well, why don't we change it and make it circular so you never have to track yourself back through this one area. Wow. And so they just, you know, and they were allowed to do that. They felt empowered to do that because they didn't say, well, here, here's the blueprints, you follow the blueprints, and this is how you set it up, no question. So they actually asked their supervisor, hey, is it okay if we modify this, you know, just change this, you know, component this way so we can just have it in a circular manner. And they were empowered to say yes. They didn't have to say, well, I gotta go ask my boss and let me go ask. Yeah. And so it was a good idea and it didn't violate anything. It still worked. Um, and uh, and that's, that's just an example of allowing. And they were just so proud to talk about how they came about it. And they were so um, willing to say, you know, this was private you know, Smith's idea and this was Specialist Jones's idea, just you know, bringing the team together. And they were just, you could just see the pride in these little young soldiers to come up with an idea. Right. Um, that made uh, more sense and a more efficient use and actually better safety because you don't want to track you know, instruments through an area. I mean, there's, there's checks and balances, but it really was a, a triple check right. to make sure. So that's just an example of you know, leadership where you empower your subordinates to come up with good ideas. The other thing, and I'm about to scan for questions because I want you to join us. We have so, few, so, so, so little time left together. Um, but I was also struck, as, as we've gotten to know each other, is how the medical per personnel in particular um, and throughout the military are really on the front lines of some of the hot button issues of our time, and has been historically. The integrated force, women, women serving in military, transgender troops serving in military. Could you talk a little bit about how you've been, um, you've, you've watched the, the healthcare force evolve and how training has evolved? Absolutely, and um, and again, it's uh, you know it's like you know you're not your father's Buick, you know that that commercial or right. grandfather. This is not your grandfather's army because um, my sisters uh, joined in the late '60s, early '70s, and they were wax in the women's army corps. Where women used to actually be separate um, in a separate branch from the male soldiers, and so. Um, you know, just think of starting that to fast forward. Now you have women in every occupational specialty, women that are commanding hospitals. Um, they're in forward surgical teams that are way out, you know, that go out and support our, our special mission units um, and with very austere environments. Um, and so it's one, it's not based upon your gender, it's based upon what your, what your capability is. They don't ask for, we need a female X, Y, Z, unless it's like the, um, in Afghanistan, Right. or you know, the cultural um, teams that we have, the cultural engagement teams where they specifically request women. And, um, and that's actually a good news story because the special forces now have a lot of women in their ranks, um, which was a traditionally male um, specialty. So we have female medics, um, special forces you know, that, that are with the special forces, the medical personnel that actually um, can engage and, 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 improve, um, and improve that. Training as well. I mean, training is based upon, again, I'm, I'm a dermatologist. We have, you know, female surgeons. You know, we have a female neurosurgeon. We've got all types of specialties um, that it's just based upon your, um, your, your qualifications for that. We, we have a quick, Julia, is that you? Hello? Yeah. Um, so yesterday, uh, Mayor Kander, I think it was, came out yes. and said, that he was stepping down and not seeking re-election for his PTSD symptoms that came from his service. And, um, you know, PTSD has been such a big thing in the news and something we all probably experience personally or with our loved ones. Um, what is the military doing and what, what are we doing to provide a healing environment for people who come back? And also, what kind of research and how can that be transferred not just to military personnel who are going through PTSD, but the greater society as a whole? We know that 60 million people are suffering from 
an experience with sexual assault and then PTSD ongoing. And I think the last couple of weeks has been triggering for so many. Um, and, and hearing stories of like the increase in suicide, 30% you know, increase in suicide, what, what can we do to minimize this? Well, I really appreciate that question because uh, that is uh, an, an extremely um, important issue for us as uh, not only military providers but just for our nation because there are a lot of things going on that affect individuals. So a couple of things I'd like to, to mention, and I'm not, I'm not going to look at you this way, I'll just look, look, look this way so um, I, can, I won't get too far away from my mic. So it's, um, first I think it was extremely courageous for, the, you know, for him to come out and actually mention that. And that's the first thing is, is to reduce stigma so that individuals could actually identify that. In the culture in the military, it's one that you're, you're hua, right? You know, if you get injured, just rub some dirt on it, put some duct tape on it, and keep going. You don't want to admit that you're injured. And so first, it's just the admit, admitting and to reduce the stigma of getting help. And so we've had senior leaders, you know, four-star generals retired who actually came out and said, look, I had post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, and I got help. You should, too. So to make it sound like, OK, now you have a four-star that will admit it, so it's not going to end my career to say I have a problem and I need help. We also embed uh, behavioral health specialists into the unit. Since we've got these uh, uh, brigade combat teams and battalions, these are organizations, um, smaller you know, numbers of, smaller number of soldiers together. So rather than concentrate all of our mental health assets in the hospitals, we actually forward deploy them. And we have teams that are with the units. Um, over 60 plus teams, 12 member teams that are actually part of the, the, the units. And so that there's a decreased stigma because they're able to, um, in the, the soldiers are able to access them um, immediately in their area. They don't need to get a referral to go to the hospital. So it's basically having a conversation with someone that's on your team. It right. happens to be behavioral health you know, specialist. And so that's the first thing. And we've seen an improvement. Um, you know, there's uh, from 2007 to current, we've had over from 700,000 visits a year to over 2 million visits per year. Not because there's more pathology, but people feel more comfortable coming forward. And it's also decreased the hospitalization. So there's a decreased amount of um, you know, acute hospitalization for suicide ideation and acute anxiety, all those things, because they can handle it at a, uh, before it gets to be a problem. And so I think what we can do is continue to, do, to decrease the stigma, to encourage individuals to get help. If we as senior leaders say, you know, we struggle with it as well. It's that vulnerability we talked about, right. that we right. tell others it's OK, your career is not over. Right. Um, and then in, ensuring that our um, greater society knows that, um, yes, we have soldiers that struggle, but it's curable. 80% of post-traumatic stress disorder is curable. And so people don't realize that. So you're not doomed forever. You can get better. I mean, again, it's a spectrum from mild all the way to pretty severe. So, um, so that there's not a sense that you know, our soldiers or military personnel are damaged goods and we're afraid to interact with them. I think it's having those conversations, decreasing the stigma, and we also are doing, working with research. Our research command works with the National Institutes of Health and several other academic institutions to find um, better treatment plans and, um, and even markers for people who are maybe predisposed to, you know, um, you know, not just acute grief reactions, but the full spectrum. Right. And so there's a lot of research going on to make sure that we get an answer to, to, to treat that. But with, yeah. with 20 seconds left, it oh, seems dear. like what your big advice is for all of us when dealing with these big issues is to keep bringing them up. Yes. Keep bringing it to the attention of people who are in control or who are in command, who can write checks, who can do the research. Right. And really, and, and, yeah. and, and treat each other with empathy and love. Absolutely. All right. That's what it's about. Very yeah. good. I'm sorry we're out of time. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for your service. Absolutely. Thank you so Thank much you. for being part of the Fortune family. Well, thanks so much. This is awesome.